Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Saskatchewan Day. It makes you feel like you're living inside a snow globe today. It's what a beautiful morning in Saskatoon. Hi, I'm uh, Candace Waskase Lafferty, and I'm the Senior Director of the Gordon Oaks Red Bear Student Centre. I've had the pleasure of serving this campus for many years, and today is a day of being surrounded by people who I think are my community heroes. I'm absolutely blessed to be standing in for uh, Melissa Just, who is who's at home ill today. And because I'm standing in for the Dean today, I'm wondering if there's anybody here from HR who can update my file and say I was acting Dean for the day? <laughs> No? Could uh, really use the bump up. Could, you know, could use the career progression. Anyway, um, the, yeah, so Luke and Melissa are very sad that they couldn't be here. I know they've committed a lot of time and resources to making this all happen today, and with deep regret that they've asked me to fill in. And so I'm a poor, I'm a poor fill in for, for Melissa Just, but I'd like to begin uh, by welcoming you all here today to this very, very special event, which of course takes place on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We are here because we are going to be listening to a conversation with Maria Campbell and Christy Belcourt, led by the Wonderful, my dear friend Marilyn. I'm so looking forward to today. I, I was so nervous, I almost said no because you women are my heroes. Uh, I've looked up to you for so many, many years and it's just an, a true honor to stand in the same place as you today. So I'll stop before I cry. <laughs> well, I'd like to begin our time together by inviting Joni Tauha, who is a master storyteller and artist from Sturgeon Lake First Nation, and he's also the college's cultural advisor, and ask him to come forward and appropriately and mark and bless this special cultural occasion. Joe, I ask if um, I very humbly present this ribbon and this tobacco to you. Um, what your gifts are and what you share with us is of deep, significant value, and I offer this to you with deepest respect. Good afternoon. I believe it is afternoon. The Tamskat now Rakio, the Naskamon. And uh, yeah, Luke and I have been arranging to see what would be appropriate for gifts and honoring our Iskwiwak. Uh, Fireheart women, I guess you would say, Fireheart. Igoyaka, the Naskamo Maria Capia, a spimotot. You know, to copy to scan, to put to scheme, to cut your yaw to sky. So I just want to thank uh, Maria just for having uh, faith in me, I guess, to uh, to be part of this college, you know, College of Law. And she uh, paved the way, you know, for me to step in and uh, mess it all up. <laughs> we messed around, but we did a great job this year. We had a teepee set up, we had a pipe ceremony. We got a little teepee out there if you get a chance to look. There's a little miniature teepee just to remind us we. We have a holding here in this territory called Treaty 6. So I'm going to do a couple of songs. And uh, thank you, Candice, for the introduction, for, for the offerings. And ask them one. And uh, welcome to the other panelists here, Kent Christy. I'm looking forward to seeing your, your painting. And your, we were talking about the painting and what's the image in there. You might be interested because uh, Wilford Buck talks about that uh, that sturgeon that you'll see there. It's in, in our language. It's uh, Namu, Namu, and I come from Sturgeon Lake actually too. You know, but they don't call it Namu Sagaichen. They call it Buck the Hawaii Sagaichen Net Casting Lake. So I'm going to approach the chief and counsel. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Make a slight change there. <laughs> I think it's really, really beautiful because those, those are sacred stories. So I'm going to do a welcome song and then I'll do a, um, a thunder song or something related to water because uh, the sturgeon symbolizes a Milky Way, apparently with Wilfred Buck's uh, like elders' teachings that he was uh, raised with, you know, that he grew up with learning from the elders from Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba. So the teachings, so look him up. He's really interesting. He's got a YouTube sharing there. So I'm looking forward to this panel discussion. So 
got the dumb Scott and all, and ask him, no, thank you. And you look beautiful in your scarves. <laughs> yeah, my, so I thank Luke for helping to select stuff like that. We were supposed to do it together, so. <laughs> more to honor the, the drum tradition, so. Kisugaimao, Pipa <laughs> Okay, let's have a good conversation. <laughs> Thank you, Marilyn. Should I give you the mic here? <laughs> Can I actually get a round of applause for Joni Toho? I tell you, I tell you. When you want the best, you bring in Joe Natal every time he delivers. I've never seen him miss the mark. You're just, you're just amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> I love working with Joe, and he's part of a, a large group of, of cultural people who work with and through the university, and we're just absolutely honored to have them. Uh, Joe, thank you. We're celebrating a special event in the life of the Law Library. Which, required, uh, which has now acquired a remarkable and significant painting by artist Christy Belcourt. And it is now, we will have it in home of the college's library. And uh, right after this presentation, I, and, and I um, encourage you all to go visit the uh, law library and you will see, uh, you'll see the full life-size version of that. The first conversations about this commission entitled Every Dot, A Prayer for Saskatchewan Rivers began more than two years ago and involved a great many of people, too many to possibly uh, to, to uh, name all together today. However, I did want to acknowledge the College of Law and Dean <clears throat> Martin Phillips, 
Johnson, not only for hosting this event in our college today, but for believing so strongly as he does in the library. And that the themes of natural law and environmental justice reflected in this piece will be a valuable source of ongoing reflection, inspiration, and education for law students for years to come and for anyone else who visits this space. Is uh, Dean Phillipson here? I'm just going to get him to give us a wave. I know he, uh, I saw him struggling a little bit this morning, but I, I know he's well. Anyway, thank you to, uh, to the Dean. Before I introduce our moderator, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for their perspectives and their insights, um, and guiding us with the knowledge and the light that you bring to us. Uh, never underestimate the, the power and the magnitude of Indigenous knowledges. I have learned that from these two women, and it's a true gift for us. So to begin in a proper way, I'm going to present each of them with the appropriate protocol. Give me one moment. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator. She is a systems designer and thinker. Marilyn Putra is a graduate of Harvard Law School and the University of Saskatchewan's College of Law. She has litigated, taught, negotiated, researched, and studied natural law. She is the former director of the university's Indigenous Law Center and the former commissioner for Canada's National Enquirer into the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And she is the perfect person to guide this conversation. Please welcome Marilyn Petra. I am so excited to be here. It was the equivalent of a Christian Christmas morning for me getting up today. <laughs> There's so many parts of the discussion today that you're not going to be aware of unless I give you a little primer. And one of them that you won't be aware of is at universities, we tend to silo information. There's the College of English, and there's the College of Agriculture, and there's the College of Law, and there's the College of Business, and there's the College of Engineering, and we pretend those things are all separate. And from an Indigenous reality, that's not a reality. That's so made up, that's so constructed and so artificial, we're constantly trying to fit ourselves into those spaces and separate ourselves from that. But we're coming to a time where we see very clearly that doesn't work anymore. It's taken us a long time to realize that we're all sort of pooling together. And what you're going to hear today is a conversation about art and activism, about water and animals and birds and bugs and, and fish and flyers. And what you're going to hear about today is about the underlying foundation of indigenous perspective, worldview, philosophy that drives who we are. Another thing that you aren't gonna realize is that when you have two artists speaking to you in a college of law, and you think about why would they get artists to come and present this? Why would, you know, why are we here at the College of Law? And I am so jumping up and down with my happy bingo dance right now that there are three Indigenous women and a fourth one that inter introduced us and Joe sang us into this space. Welcome to 2022. Uh, it's a good place. And that what you need to know is this is the week that we celebrate the life of Louis Riel, 
uh, because he was hung this week in history. And that it matters that this painting is being released into the law library at the college and that it's, it's hiding things for you to find. And we're gonna have a great conversation with these two leaders to give you some idea about how to, how to find things that are hidden. And we're gonna talk about um, artists and activists being the actual people that are holding that information. You know, the famous quote that everybody talks about, Louis Riel said, wait for, they'll sleep for 100 years and the artists will waken them. Well, if you really look at artists, they're the political activists in every single community. If you look at when the first thing to be cut in education programs is art. Not because it's irrelevant, not because uh, students don't need that, because shit, those are shit disturbers. We gotta get them like a lower that temperature. We gotta, we gotta dial that volume back, right? Pardon my language. And so what happens when some of those get through? What happens when they take up their own art? What happens when their voice is so strong you can hear it in every corner of the globe? And that's the lives of the two women that I've been asked to inter introduce to you today. So it was a little bit daunting when I got up this morning to go, how do you introduce Christy Belcourt and Maria Campbell to people? First of all, they probably need no introduction. Secondly, um, they're my heroes. I've taught with Maria for, well, the better part of probably 20 years. And, um, and I'm so proud to have that sistership with her. I have met Christy through Maria, and I met her actually here at the college when you were working on the conference that Paul Chartrand had put together, and you did a presentation on in that conference. And it was so powerful, it blew me away. And since then, I've been addicted to her art and her following. And the other thing that's a secret that you won't know until I tell you right now, unless you were at the ceremony, is that Maria's facial tattoos were put there by Christy in a ceremony when Maria and I started working on the commission, and Maria put those there to tell the world that her life has been and will continue to be committed to Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirited people. So I, I need you to feel the context, okay? I want you to see that there's a lot going on here. So sit back. Forget everything you know. Open your mind to what might be happening here today and let me introduce you to a couple of women and then they're each gonna take turns talking about art and about the work that they do. So Christy Belcourt, you can read what you'd like to read about her. There's a paragraph for, available for you, but you need to know that this woman is tireless, tireless about language and culture that she is in constant pursuit of the core of the heartbeat of who we are as Indigenous people, who she is as an Indigenous woman. She has just spent, she can talk to us about how many years she's put into her language center that is now a reality and is a beautiful, stunning, amazing place to bring language to life in, in the territory in Ontario. She can tell you about going and traveling with her father and Maria last summer and finding family members and laughs and chuckles and some crazy memories about where she comes from. She can tell you about the artwork she's produced that's on walls and put into street corners all over the place in North America and, um, and why her art has become so larger than life. She can tell you about every dot a prayer for the Saskatchewan River. And I'm ashamed to tell you when she started doing this piece and released it that I didn't know that the South Saskatchewan River was endangered. And so artists are activists. She has touched the lives of so many people. She, she paves the way for this. She has uh, come to understand water ceremony. She works with artists and language keepers in every community she can go into. And she's a very proud, strong family member of the Belcourt family and represents them in lots and lots of places. Uh, Maria, what do I say about Maria Campbell? Make it short is the, always the instruction. <laughs> you cannot introduce this woman. She's got more honorary doctorates than you can shake a stick at. She's 
She's an artist, she's an activist, she's a storyteller, she's a law keeper, she's a student of the universe, she's a teacher of natural law, she's a mother, she's a grandmother, she's a great-grandmother, she is a sister to more siblings than any of us put together have. She's an adopted mother. She has been working on the rights of women and children since she was born. Her life has been a protest to how women and children are treated, and she has spent all of her life, every store will hold a, a germ of a story, of a seed, of how she was protecting somebody in the work she was doing someplace, how she was standing up for something in the work she was doing. Whether it was, I'll tell you a story. I was talking to her about working at the BAMP Center. And while we were chatting about working at the BAMP Center, I said to her something about um, how it got started and the art center and how that got going. She said, yeah, I remember one time Pierre Burton and I were sitting outside having this conversation. And I was like, what? <laughs> like, oh, hello? And she said, well, it was when it started, you know. And then another time we were talking and she was saying, well, you know, we got the very first women's shelter started in Alberta. The shelter's still there. And you know, when I really started looking at the crossing and trying to hold the crossing, the original home of Gabriel Dumont there, um, we were, how, how I came to know that land and how I came to own that land, and there's like four books in there. The writing of Halfbreed, all of the stories within Halfbreed, the resurgence of Halfbreed and the two women from the East that found the missing pages. Like, she has influenced more lives than all of us could imagine together. So welcome to a fantastic chat with these two about the impact and importance of art in our lives. I am gonna... I'm gonna... So here you have it. It is absolutely fitting and amazing and appropriate that this piece be in the law library. Because not all law is written in text. The most important law, the law that you never have to go and remember, is someplace else. And in a teaching that Maria gives to all of us, everybody has a piece of the puzzle. So you've got two people that are gonna talk today about a piece of the puzzle that they have. So Christy, can I get you to start us off with just a little discussion? Are you good with that? A discussion about the piece and how it comes together for you and what you want to tell us about it. And then I'd like Maria to jump in. Yeah. OK. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today and being here. Um, I'm really honored to be here. And thank you to Luke and everybody at the law office who commissioned the piece. and. You know, it's just really, it's always great. I love Saskatchewan so much, and I love Saskatoon, and it's only the winter that keeps me really from moving here. <laughs> and, uh, but I really do love it. I love the river. My, uh, my people, uh, we, we're on Lake St. Anne, but we're also in Edmonton at parts of this river. This river connects uh, many communities. It's given life to people for, and animals, and birds, and all sorts of everything for uh, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. This river is old. The rivers, the Saskatchewan rivers, both of them, are life givers. They have given life for, uh, you know, they're the veins of, of Mother Earth. And uh, the water is sacred. Water is alive. Water holds life. It holds it the same way a, a child or a, a newborn is held in its mother's womb, surrounded by water. We, water holds life for this planet and for all of us. And that is the impetus for this, uh, this painting, is to remember the first, the very first uh, element, the most sacred of elements is water because that's what we're born in. And so that's why half of the painting is covered in water, or not covered in water, but represents water. The, um, the sturgeon is in there. It's, uh, it used to be uh, found in many river systems in uh, North America and uh, in, in the Saskatchewan rivers. And uh, unfortunately, it's, uh, 
being extirpated and it's endangered. Uh, the lake sturgeon in particular, the one that is in the river systems, is, con is on the endangered species list. Um, a sturgeon will wait, uh, will not wait, but they'll have to be 25 years old before she will be able to spawn. Uh, and uh, she will only lay her eggs in clean river beds. In, in the cl so anywhere that's been disturbed by uh, development or anything at all, um, they, they won't lay their eggs there. The sturgeon and the frogs have a relationship together. Um, I had a dream once that I was standing in water with my arm around a sturgeon, and the sturgeon said to me in my mind, I miss the frogs. And I thought, well, what was that about? You know, I, I, I never really was much for fish or anything. I mean, I, I love fish, but I never thought much about them until that moment. This was a dream maybe 25 years ago, and ever since then I've loved the sturgeon. And I found out that the Menominee people uh, have a, a legend where that they talk about in their stories uh, that the frogs, that the sturgeon will wait for the frogs to sing before they will come back to spawn. And so they have a relationship that is not predator and prey. They have a relationship that is has nothing to do with us as human beings. It has to do with just them and uh, their own relationship. And the frogs also are telling us that our environment is in trouble. And uh, so we, we need to pay attention to them. So that's why the sturgeon is front and central in the painting. And uh, they're just really beautiful. Sturgeons are so beautiful. And I think, too, when I think about sturgeons, there's uh, places where I know people will set nets, and they'll catch sturgeons in their nets. And But uh, we are environmental stewards, as well as carrying knowledge. And indigenous people have a responsibility also to be environmental stewards. And we also, in our traditional law, in our ways of knowing and understanding how to behave in the world, we know when conservation is necessary. We know when a place is getting, when there's not enough beavers in one area, we'll leave that area alone. When there's not enough moose in one area, we'll leave that area alone. When there's not enough sturgeon in the river, we shouldn't be catching them either, even if it is part of our sacred uh, foods. We, need, we do this because we know how to be good environmental stewards of the, of the earth. Um, uh, the heron is in there because that's one of Maria's uh, most beautiful loved birds. And uh, I spent, uh, we have spent a lot of time, members of, of uh, the lodge, Maria's lodge, on the Saskatchewan River at Gabriel's Crossing. And so this also holds many uh, deep personal meanings for me, for the times that I've been there attending and participating in ceremony or fasting. Um, and uh, as Maria said, the, the herons are so elegant because they're high steppers. <laughs> and then I read this, uh, I read this thing about Métis women, uh, Métis people dancing as high steppers, or maybe you told me that. <laughs> and so uh, the burrowing owl is in there. Um, the owls are, are, are messengers, and they're messengers of, uh, of something to come. They're not to be feared. They're to be respected for their powers and their gifts. Their gift is being a messenger. And uh, the burrowing owl is also on the endangered species list. It's, um, it, it, it's the only owl that burrows in the ground and lays its eggs in the ground. And it will, if you've ever seen a, a films, watch it on YouTube, burrowing owls can mimic rattlesnakes and they teach their young to do that and they, they shake their heads and sound just like rattlesnakes and what they do is when the bison were coming over or when anything was coming over that would be threatening to their their uh, burrow they would they would make the sound of rattle many rattlesnakes and uh, but the uh, you know the the grounds are being tilled we're over farming uh, we're not leaving enough for natural grasses or for the natural animals that make the holes for the burrowing owls to to uh, burrow into, um, and uh, we're taking we're taking too much space. We human beings are taking up too much space. We're not leaving enough space for the animals to survive and thrive. We think we have an entitlement to everything, I suppose, and it comes from Judeo-Christian teachings. We really need to change our minds to understand that we are just one, and we are actually at the bottom of the food chain, not at the top. 
we're at the bottom because we need everything to survive and nothing needs us. Um, the prairie clover are, uh, is also an endangered species. So is the um, the, tr the moccasin uh, flowers. Those are uh, white, mo uh, white uh, what are they called again? Anyway, those ones, they're, in, they're on the endangered species list. The Kerner blue butterfly is on the endangered species list. And sadly, so now is the, uh, the Lorondel. What is it? The, s the sparrow, the barn swallow. Yeah, they're, uh, they're on the uh, endangered species list. And when I used to first go to Maria's many years ago, they were in abundance there all over, uh, and, and now they're hardly anywhere. And, um, and so those are, the, those are the elements in there. Uh, there's a uh, pecan in there, the, the nuts. There's spiders in there because uh, spiders always uh, are, I have a personal connection with spiders. And um, the roots, of course, the medicines, to think about not only our lives, but uh, what is underground, what is our roots, where do we come from, that's why I always show the roots in my paintings, to think about those things. And so sacred law is natural law, and natural law and sacred law is the, what we are governed by. And when we start to think about natural law, we think about the seasons, the sun, the moon, the stars, we think about uh, times of day. You know, we are so conformed into the Gregorian calendar and the clock and the, you know, the way that we have to do things to fit into ca this capitalist model of living that we are moving further and further away from sacred law and from natural law. But when we go into ceremony, when we go to sit in our favorite places, when we sit by the river and we just think about these things, all of that comes back to us because we actually are part and one in the same with everything. We are connected to everything and we are not different at all. None of us are. And so we are able to pull out of ourselves our connection to the earth and, and our desires, our love for the future generations. So this is what I have to say about the painting. So I, I'm just getting over a little cold, so that's my voice is a little, uh, might start having a coughing fit, but I thank you for listening. I'll pass it on to you. So thank you. You get an inside scoop at the artist's thoughts and her heart as she prepared this for our college. This is going to be the gift from Christy to us that you can go in and when you're sitting and you're trying to figure out how can I get grounded to study or read or work for the students that are in here, you look at this painting. It's supposed to take you places. And it's teaching you that natural law is all around you and it's looking for you and you're looking for it. Go find it. Look at the tree that's outside your window. That's become your teacher. If you've never ever heard of sturgeon or any of the plants she mentioned or you didn't pay attention to barn swallows that for any of you who sort of are over 40 in the room, those are definitely birds that we all knew in our communities. They're here to teach you something that's not just, oh my God, they're on the endangered species list, pass the salt. It's let's pay attention to what's going on here, okay? So now I'm going to ask Maria if she'll, um, if she'll jump in and have a chat. So Maria and Christy have worked together for a long time. They're currently, they've written together. They're working on a book and some images together. Uh, she's part, Christy's part of Maria's Lodge, and Maria's been a teacher to so many. And I would love for you to jump in, and you can tell stories, or you can jump into the, your painting concepts, what, whatever you'd like to share. Thank you. Can I ask them now? I saw Louise come in a little while ago. Oh, there she is. <laughs> I just wanted to acknowledge her. She's a, a Cree poet and a really beautiful one. And Tristan is in here. Tristan is a, a fiddle player and a poet as well. And there's probably others. I think I saw Tara come in. She's from the gallery at Remy. And she does some beautiful work. And there's some good things happening over there. And thank you, Candice, for introduction. And Joseph in Tangamoyen. So uh, I'm always embarrassed when I get introduction like that. That's uh, I never I, I don't know what to say. 
when we were little kids, if you if somebody introduced you like that, you'd kind of put your head down and and move your foot around in the dirt. <laughs> your mother would tell you to stop, <laughs> to stop. Um, but anyway, I just this painting is beautiful. When you see it downstairs, it's really quite emotional. Um, because so many things in, in that river I, I remember and, and the things that grow around it that are not there anymore. When I was a little girl, my, uh, uh, they, my uh, dad would put uh, um, a fish hook. Up. It's a special kind of hook that they would use for, uh, for, um, for the sturgeon. And, and he would pull a fish out that would feed just about everybody that was around because they were just huge. And when he was a little boy, they would they would come from from uh, McDowell area to to Batash and then and then cut across to go to to Beardy's to the reserve, and uh, they would camp along the river at Gabriel's Crossing, and and they tell the story of how one one sturgeon would feed ten families for the week that they were camped by the river. They were, when you when you see how big they are now, if you you're lucky enough to see one, they might weigh five ten pounds, you know. But when you think that they fed uh, families ten families for a week, it, it's hard to imagine that we ever had river uh, fish like that in the South Saskatchewan. The 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 um, blue heron. There's been a nest uh, around the corner from from the crossing probably for 50 years that that I've been out there and, and know of it. But according to the old people that lived there before I came, the, that uh, nesting place was there for a long time, and I haven't seen them for the last four years. So I don't know if they finally gave up because the river levels are, you know, they open the dam or they close the dam, and so they're... Uh, there are so many nests that get flooded out every year. You see them floating when the when the water is opened, and so I don't know if they've died and they're not coming back or what's happened to them. But their uh, blue heron are beautiful. I remember waking up in a in the Sylvia Hotel in Vancouver about 25 years ago. I was doing some publicity and I and I stayed there and walked outside and the whole the whole area was full of blue hair, and I had never seen so many. There were literally, I'm sure, thousands of them. And it was a stopping place. They, they stopped there. And, and when you come uh, this way, you're lucky if you see a blue heron anymore. And um, tiger lilies are really special because they carry really special laws. But the story of tiger lily is that uh, she was lost there's a, a beautiful story about her uh, and that we're, we're working on. But she, uh, she was lost uh, as a, a, a two or three year old child, and this is a really old story. And uh, out in the prairie and the buffalo found her and they looked after her till she was about six years old. And then uh, they took her to a family of humans and, and left her there. And she always knew she didn't belong in that place. She had the color of, of hair that, of, of the, uh, of, the uh, of the tiger lily, that kind of orange red hair. And she had freckles. And, and so she knew that she didn't belong to these people. And so she looked all over, did all sorts of things. It's a long, long story. And it was a long journey for her. And um, an old man told her how to get to, uh, how to find her people. And so uh, she started the journey, and sweetgrass helped her. There were different uh, medicines that helped her along the way. River, uh, river birch was one of them. And uh, poplar tree was, was the one who gave her the most help because she needed a song to be able to, to get there. And, and he told her that if she sang the song and, and waited till... And, and also Owl. Um, owl would take her, because Owl is one of the only creatures that can fly in that few seconds that the, um, and there's a name for it, and I'm, 
I'm not, I can't remember, maybe uh, Joseph or Louise remember, but there's a, a time when the sun is coming up and when it's going down for a few seconds that you can go through, in our stories, you can go through that, that crack in the, in the world and then you have to wait to come back again. And Owl is one of the few creatures that can do that to you and do that for you in the story. And so she, Poplar Tree gives her this song and it's the, the little quivering poplar tree that sings those beautiful songs in the summer when the, whether it's windy or not, it's, uh, it's singing. She learns the song and then Owl takes her early in the morning and, and uh, she gets through that crack in the, in the dawn. And she um, ends up in the other world and uh, visits her family. And then one day she's, she comes home and uh, she's a no she becomes a really old lady and um, is, a, is a medicine person. She doctors her people and does that until she's in her uh, probably late 90s when they say that meant that she was really, really old. And um, one day uh, the people get up and, and she's gone. They can't find her. And in her place where her lodge was were, were these little tiger lilies. And, and there's a special medicine in the root of the tiger lily that's used for birthing that uh, old ladies used to pick and nobody, we were always taught never to, to break them off or to pick them. And uh, because uh, once you do that, they don't come back again, They're, they don't regrow. And there was a special ceremony when they went to dig the root for, uh, for birthing medicine. Um, and she's always close to the, the, that little poplar tree that gave her the songs. So when you find tiger lily, you'll see those little poplars all close by because the two of them are always together and there's usually owls nearby as well. And sweet grass, all of those things grow close to her. So there's, it's a beautiful story and I can remember, you know, there were no redheads in our family, but in Métis communities, sometime you find you find people with red hair. And I remember telling Marilyn that story a long, long, long time ago before she went to law school. And uh, she started to cry because she used to have hair almost that color when she was a little girl. <laughs> so it's, it's one of my favorite stories. Uh, Brown-eyed Susans are also uh, the, something in the root is used for midwifery. And it's also another uh, another plant that uh, you don't see very often anymore. They used they used to be all over the little uh, brown-eyed Susans. I don't know what they're called in English, but they they uh, always grew close to tiger lilies. So laws that have to do with birthing medicines, you know, uh, are all wrapped up in those plants that that grow close to the water. And, and the water, as Christy told you, is the first water that, you know, a, a baby is, when the spirit decides to leave that world, it, uh, it, it uh, chooses its family in the place it's going to come in, in our way. And uh, when it's born, it goes into the body of a woman and it's there for the nine months and it's nurtured and, and blessed by menstrual blood which are all the things that we, t we were taught as children are really evil and, and wrong, and that's why babies have to be baptized. But those were the things that nurtured them, and the very first protector they had was water that was wrapped around that womb and uh, protected them, which is why women are, are water keepers and why we should all be looking after water because water was our first protector and it needs our protection now. And there are all kinds of laws that are uh, a part of water. And frogs are really important. Part of our tradition is when the frogs start to sing in the spring, then you no longer tell the stories. The sacred stories aren't told anymore because they have stories to tell and we should be listening to them. When I was a little girl, and I'm sure that's true for many of us, you could go outside after a rain and there'd be little frogs all over the place, all kinds of colors, and some of them would be so tiny. I know I used to be really bad. I'd 
Uh, one of the old ladies, my granny's friends, uh, chewed snuff. Sometime women chewed snuff in our communities long, long ago. But uh, she was a, a, and she would send me to the store to get her uh, snuff, and she'd give me the empty box. And so I would run to the store, come back with the snuff. But if it rained, I'd fill it full of frogs because it would scare the daylight out of her. <laughs> got into really serious trouble and found out that they that frogs you don't mess around with frogs but um, all kinds of stories about kids with frogs if you uh, ever hurt one the uh, old ladies would uh, cook it and you would have to eat it drink the broth and eat it because you didn't kill animals or little creatures unless you you were going to eat them but in that whole uh, I remember years ago, Christy uh, coming, and we went walking in the, there's a meadow not far from the, from the river that's uh, still natural ground, and we found all kinds of plants, and I had never seen a, a, a wild onion since I was really a little girl, and, and she found a, a place where there was a whole, a whole bunch of wild onions, little, and they're just the most delicate little plant and uh, that's the only place in that whole river valley in, in the area, you know, between, I would imagine, uh, Prince Albert and, uh, and, and where we live, and probably all the way here where you'll find wild onions. And um, the other thing we found was, was um, and it was medicine, again, that was used for midwifery. So it seems like everything that grows close to the river was, and, and by the water was used by midwives, which means that there was lots of laws along the river because it's old ladies that are the keepers of, of laws. Our first grandmother was a, what we call uh, she was the keeper of, of laws. So when you look at this, for anybody who's studying um, plants, usually you get the stories and the laws, and your teaching, this is a beautiful teaching tool to use because we have one in the, in the ceremonial room here. There's, and, and Christy and Isaac did the, the artwork up on top of that, and that one is specific laws, and in there are the two old grandmothers that are talking to each other, and they're having conversation about law. And, and how you govern what's happening in the, in the family, in the community. Because they were the, the people who did that. They, they were the, I guess you would call them almost police, the judges, the, they did everything. And that was like that right up until probably about 50 years ago, where you would, uh, you would see that role really strong. There are still some some grandmothers that do that, but not too many places. And you see that in all of the things that are happening today. So that's um, a pretty amazing painting. And thank you, Christy. Thank you, Maria. So there's about 10 minutes left. I asked you to keep your minds open so that you would see law and understand law in a different way. The late Simon Kaitwe had has a teaching that says, when you're sitting and listening to story, and the snow is on the ground, we can talk about sacred story. When you're sitting and listening to story, some part of that story is going to run across a room and jump onto your toe and grab onto your pant leg or run up your leg and hang on to you for the rest of the day. So before you think about your question, and before I open this up, I want you to feel the rascal that ran across the floor. What part are you remembering? Are you attached to frogs? Do you know something about brown-eyed Susans? Do you wonder about where medicines are kept? Are you now going to go home and think about the relatives that are right outside your door? Because you just had a teaching about how everything in Christie's painting <coughs> is related to each other. It is. We used to say cold season. It's COVID season. <coughs> so... We're trying to maintain some distance and we'll just give Christy a chance to catch her breath again. But we want, we want this to be a conversation. So if anybody's got their rascal 
or if anybody has a question they can't wait to ask about, we can ask Maria to keep her storyteller hat on and she's given you all kinds of ideas about how to find the treasures that are right outside of you. She has given you huge teachings about why it's natural law and how we live by that. So is there anybody dying to ask a question? I'm hoping, there we go. Ms. Lee. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Are you good? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and the beautiful artwork. I'm looking forward to seeing it in the library. Um, I work on a project right now with the Office of the Treaty Commission on duty to consult. And one of the projects that has really come to the forefront is the Lake Diefenbaker expansion, which will flood a very large area. Um, so it'll take up a lot of land, a lot of um, habitat. It'll have a big impact on the waters and uh, plant life and animals and fish. And as I'm sitting here listening to the presentation, the gift, the teaching, I, I think how lucky I am to hear it and to be present for it. But I think there are so many other people that are promoting, that are supporting that Lake Diefenbaker expansion that need to hear this. And so what I'm going to ask is if you would, you know, repeat this teaching in some fashion to those people who need to hear it as well. Um, it, you know, to be an influence on changing that project. We hear that the province is very committed to that project moving forward, have really leaned into it, and I'm hoping not so far that they can't pull themselves back. But I feel like this kind of a teaching would have some kind of influence. So I'm hoping that you would be able to, or you'd be in a position to share or repeat this in another venue where those people might be able to hear that. I do it every chance I can. <laughs> but you can also make a difference here as well as, as uh, students. You're going to have power and authority pretty soon and you might not think you're going to have any, but you do, you're going to have a voice and people are going to listen to you. And you can do that by, by working with communities that are trying to save their, their um, you know, natural places. Uh, save water. Mary's talking about what they're going to do with the river. That will be the second time and probably even more, for all we know. But twice for sure, because when the dam was built, there was a lot of land that was taken up. But a lot of sacred sites that were lost in that as well as other things. You know, part of that is responsible for the way that the river is today uh, and, the, and, the, and the loss of, of a lot of the wildlife. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, I see Louise wants to say something over there. Dance. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so wonderful to see the three of you up there and my sisters and brothers in this group. I, uh, you know, I, uh, the word ginosel, and I'm just got a brain fart and I needed to ask. Ginosel, um, what's the other word? Ekinoskusit, okay. I wonder if it has something to do with um, our emergence from the water. My question is, and I'll try to translate this into English so people will understand, um, how are we related to the fish? In, because in the word the fish, it implies there's a lengthy or a tall sense of being from that entity from where we're born, and it also has a uh, length. So I'm just wondering, I say me no more, get piano, take skate the man, 
That's my curiosity. My grandmother used to say that, my great-grandmother used to say that uh, that water protects us because, uh, because uh, that's where we came from. Like we came from, from that place. I don't know what, what she meant by we because there's, I don't, I, uh, I've, it's really hard to explain about Atayokeuna Ekwakayas. There's, there was, um, there, we have many stories, sacred stories, and the ones that we probably know best are just Atayokeuna, but there were other stories before because we, this is not our first world. There was a world before before this one, and then there was a world before that one. And, uh, and part of that is when you're learning about uh, directions, you know, north, east, and south, and, and we say, uh, uh, in, in that world, it was when the ice went home. So in somewhere in there are those stories that we, we, came, from, uh, we came from the water. So it's quite possible because we're always, I always remember being told by, by elders that if you want to know law, look at the word and study it and take it apart. And, and I call them word bundles, that you'll find a word bundle and you'll find, you'll find all of those in there. You, know, you have Joseph in, in here that's a, a, a fluent speaker. If you go take a word to him and uh, start working with him to take that word apart, and talk to other Cree speakers and ask them the same questions that you would ask him, and then start to put those words together because they they give you all that information. You do that all the time, Louise, with your poetry. Yeah. If any of you are not familiar with Louise's poetry, it's got lots of laws and all kinds of things in it because she works with with those kinds of. You have to think different. It, it's. Uh, you, ha you, ha you know, we were always, people always say indigenous people didn't ask questions. That's not true. That's what we were made to believe, that we didn't ask questions. We wouldn't have survived if we didn't ask questions. We were really critical thinkers. And so playing with story bundles and working with a word is critical thinking. You ha it teaches you how to think in a different way. And that, that's a really good way to think if you're going to law school or if you're taking any other kinds of classes, but especially if you're indigenous and you want to, to understand indigenous law, is yes. to, uh, you don't have to learn to speak the language, that's intimidating, but you can learn one word at a time and you build up a big bundle with it. So Kineseo, Kineseo is the bigger, it, it's long, it's, it's stretched. It's the big category of swimmers. And, and that's all part and parcel of what uh, Mary was talking about. If we're talking about flooding land, those are all connected and interconnected, all of those stories and those words, those fish and that water and what happens to the land, and then what eventually will happen to us. And Louise, I'll tell you that Joseph's sister. I see her. Um, <laughs> I see you over there. Um, Joseph's sister has some teachings about mermaids. If you want to talk to Yvonne about that, she's got some teachings about that too. Okay, we have another question. Um, well, first of all, I really admire that painting there. Um, and now my question is, how can kids like me help protect the waters of Saskatchewan? Such a good question, and thank you. Um, do you know who Autumn Pelche is? So Autumn started when she was about your age. She went to a ceremony, and at the ceremony, um, uh, it was held in Serpent River First Nation, and in that place, there was a, a boil water advisory, and that inspired her to start looking into it more. And so Autumn just continually spoke out so that's one way, is just to use your voice. And don't get discouraged if people don't listen, because there are people who will listen. 
So just remember, there will be people who won't listen, but there will be people who will. And that's the important thing. And, um, you know, one thing that I told a friend of mine, he's a, he's a young man, he's, his name is Quinn Miyawasagi. He said his, his community's always bought, sort of wanting him to run for political office for chief and all that stuff. And, and I said, you know, Quinn, go on the rivers first and go on to the land and really get to know the rivers and the land around where you live and your territory, where you're, where you're at. And once you get to know it intimately and love every single part of it, then you will always protect it. You will always stand up for it because you will know it like the back of your hand. Just by you wanting to protect the rivers, you will find other people who will want to as well. Join forces with them and use your voice and never give up. That's, that's, all, that's what I can tell you. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I just wanted to. Uh, I just wanted to uh, say thank you, and and uh, uh, I, I just I, I, <laughs> I think that uh, kids are so special because that's who's going to inherit what happens to the water, and and. Uh, She's also going to inherit what you decide you're going to do about it, whether you're old, you're young, whether you're a student or you're, you're a teacher. It makes all the difference in the world because children are the inheritors of everything that we do. So uh, we can do precious things. How many people ever go to the river and we're right beside it you know, and, and know what's out there? So you, you have lots of power to make change, and I, I hope that you do that. I just want to add that standing up in a room full of adults in a university where we're not expecting a little one to stand up is a huge act of activism, and that it changes the space when there's a child in it, and it changes the space when there's old people in it. It literally changes the space. So just being here, you've, you've done a lot. So I just want to honor that you were here today. Okay, Karen, can I... Dawn, do you mind if Karen goes first? She had her hand up, and then we're going to have Karen. Sh Karen, did you have your hand up? A little girl. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so we've got a brother to Maria that's up that would like to chat with us and have a little Kyoge win today. What would you like to well, say, Don? the first Dawn? thing I want to do is I want to apologize because the information I got was 1 p.m. <laughs> God. Well, that's, that happens sometimes, I guess, and messages go out. I just wanted to say that, you know, there's, a, there's a, a real strong feeling of people that the Saskatchewan rivers have to be protected and defended. Where we're really weak is in our government. We, had a, we formed a coalition when the oil was spill happened in the North Saskatchewan River, and I think you all remember that. That was terribly destructive. Very little information was given. We still don't know how much of that spill went into the, in the river system into Manitoba and Hudson Bay. But we have to really be attentive to the reality that the government is not doing what it should be doing in terms of investigating the actual impact of, water, of, of oil spills and other you know, spills that are, are tearing up our economy our, and our environment, our environment especially. So I think as long as we can work together as a collective group, community to community, and almost become direct protectors of, and, and that's inspiring when you see that beautiful arc. But standing together in solidarity is going to be the way we're going to be able to turn things around. Thank you. Thank you, Don. We have run out of ability to keep our vocal cords going, and it's also the time that we said we were going to wrap up. So. 
I just want to, I really want to honor Luke Mueller, and he is the person that works for the libraries that has literally put months and months and months into our ability to meet together today and to make sure it was done with proper protocols, that Christy was included the whole time. He did a great job. So prairie lilies are related to buffalo. And crocus, the word for crocus in Cree is Pasqua Mustus. Uh, anyway, it's, it's buffalo belly button. <laughs> so uh, every time you see a crocus, what can I leave you with so that you never forget today that there's prairie lilies in here and there's waters that keep us alive and that every single time you see a crocus, you're going to know a buffalo was born there and that it's related to birth. And so when you hear, her, when you hear stories about birth, you're hearing stories about death and recycle and, and rejuvenation and all of the systems within our natural, our natural systems. And this was a lecture on natural law and none of us practiced to be here. We just came and brought the pieces of the puzzles that we had and we shared what we had with you and that's called learning crazy, hey? And, uh, and we hope you had fun. And we hope a rascal goes home with you. So thank you. And thanks for the intros today, Candace. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you to everyone. Um, truly, best, truly, truly blessed by the knowledge we've received today. I want to do a quick shout out. Uh, someone mentioned Autumn Pelche. I also want you to now remember the name uh, Ariella. So if you could just stand up and give her a quick hand of applause. Lastly, uh, I invite you all now to uh, head over to the Law Library and see this beautiful work in live action. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>